Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Born Podcast brought to you today virtually because we have a uh, special guest uh, today. Uh, but I'm here in our studio here in central Pennsylvania. And uh, as you all know, if you've been tuning in here on the board podcast, we have the chance to champion the message of entrepreneurship and business ownership by interviewing people who've done uh, just that, who have started, built, and uh, grew successful organizations. And we get to hear directly from them uh, everything that it went through to, to do that well. You can find a full replay of our broadcast on our website at questmont.com slash born podcast. Also, if you're into social media, if you listen to podcasts on any of your favorite podcast apps, be sure to search for The Born Podcast. Click that like or follow button so you can stay up to date on all of these episodes. And today, I am personally thrilled. Uh, there's kind of a unique story behind uh, how Scott and I got the chance to meet, but we have a really cool guest. He is the former, uh, now retired, co-founder and CEO of a little clothing brand you may have heard of called Lily Pulitzer. Uh, if you haven't heard of it <clears throat> and you're a male watching, I'm sure your wife has, uh, and you've probably paid for something uh, that you didn't realize for <laughs> in the past. But uh, we have Scott on the show today. And Scott, I'm just, I'm thrilled to have you on. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Pleasure so, to I'll give the quick story if you don't if you don't mind. Uh, Scott and I uh, had dinner together at a at a group setting in uh, the Philadelphia area a number of months ago, probably six seven months ago, and uh, I didn't know who Scott was at first. And we're sitting at the the table beside each other, and he casually says, "Yeah, I was in the clothing business, and yeah, well, you might have heard of this company, Lily Pulitzer." And I just kind of did a double take, and I said, "Scott, my wife was with me. She was up in the hotel room." I said, "Scott." My wife was just on your website or your former website looking for new dresses to buy right as I walked down you know, to come to dinner tonight. And, and we just had a good laugh about it. But in any event, it's really cool to full circle, come back here and, and get a chance to learn just so much more about what you were able to do uh, with Lily. Well, thanks to wonderful people like your wife. Uh, none of my poor kids have any student debt, and I'm glad for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, then you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. So give us just a little background, Scott, on how you got into um, buying into the business and starting the business and, um, and and how that all started. Yeah, well, for this background, I, um, I had an equal partner the whole way through. You know, yep. this, this interview is with me. I had an equal partner the whole way through from inception through end. We started together. We ended together. Uh, we we're equal partners. So I just, uh, it was... And it wouldn't have happened without the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, so I was working in the apparel business uh, for 13 years prior to beginning Lily Pulitzer. And a lot of times just in the business, a lot of times you need to be in the market to learn the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, being in the business, we became aware that there was an opportunity uh, to acquire the rights to the trademark Lily Pulitzer. So um, so Lily Pulitzer, actually there were kind of two, two chapters to its history. There was a company, Lily Pulitzer, that was run from 1959 to 1984 and was closed down. Okay. And, um, and it had a very strong brand name. And I was always a big believer in brand names. And, and we're talking now in 1993. And in, in that time, I really felt that brand names were undervalued in the apparel industry. Seems surprising now, but even a company like Ralph Lauren um, it, it wasn't public then. You know, the, the, the apparel businesses tended to be small and private um, and uh, a lot of the licensing and so forth came later. So uh, Lily Pulitzer had a strong brand name. And so I became aware with a partner, uh, there was an opportunity for this. So we, um, we thought it was a good idea, even though it had actually been dormant for uh, nearly 10 years. Hmm. But it was a strong brand name. Um, and I believe in brand names. Um, uh, and we met with Lily Pulitzer and we worked out a deal over you know, a few months that we would acquire the rights to the trademark and some certain uh, rights. Uh, some some other rights. So it was just an intellectual property. There was not an operating business at all. Okay. Okay. So it was you and your partner. Yeah. Start so, from scratch. Okay. I had kind of a funny thing. On the one hand, we were a startup. I mean, we were really a startup. <laughs> uh, but we had a brand name 
that had um, some national recognition. Now, yeah. it had been dormant for 10 years, but so like, are we a startup or not? But we're a startup, but um, uh, so that's that's how we did it. But I, I think the other thing is that I was bringing domain experience to the table. I've been working in the industry for 13 years. And I think okay. that's really important in entrepreneurship that relevant domain experience really matters. Hmm. Starting a business is very difficult. <laughs> Both start a business and be learning a new industry while you're doing it is really, really difficult. Yeah. And uh, so, um, so that's that's what we did. And our intent was to bring things back to the marketplace as if Lloyd Pulitzer continued running things. Yeah. We felt very good. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in demographics, kind of getting the 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 winds behind you and you know go back to 1993 things were happening the the world was getting older richer and moving south you know yeah. it was based in florida and i mean the population of florida has doubled in 10 years you know yeah so um we had some currents going our way too yeah that matters yeah so, so. All right. So just as a maybe a high level, and we'll come back to it. Um, so you start, you you are two people starting and, and just re- truly launching from scratch. And uh, and you guys eventually sold the business. Uh, was it 20, 20 some years after you launched it? Uh, about. Yeah. Okay. So what did the business look like at that time when you sold it? Because that's really the idea of how, all right, you started from basically nothing. You had this intellectual property and a brand, but you grew it to what in terms of maybe- Yeah, so uh, et cetera. what I can tell you is, so the last year that I was CEO, and and and, and I'm retired seven years now. So yeah. uh, I retired April 1 of 2016. Um, but the last year that we ran the business, that I ran the business, but we didn't, Oh, no, we had sold it before this. And this is public information. Uh, the company did $203 million in net sales. Awesome. Uh, what I can tell you is, oh, and that was over like a 23-year period. And yeah, and my numbers might not be exactly, but I, I think it I think it took us 18 years to get from startup to 100 million and like four to go from 100 million to 200 million. Right. In terms of when you really get some momentum, and, yeah, yeah, I can speak to that topic too. And yeah, and, you know, it's it's not just economies of scale. People think, you know, like, oh well, you know, it's economies of scale and all that stuff. It, it it's not quite that. It's that you can you can afford to have highly qualified people in each position. Yeah, and you know, when you're starting a business. You know, you have some shared responsibilities. You might have somebody kind of cover two things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and in the early stage, frankly, you need you need good small scale generalists. And then as the company goes, you just need more specialists. Like, yeah. Like, uh, like for example, this. I mean, this might sound technical, but like in dresses, there's a difference between you know woven dresses that are tailored and knit dresses that are. Um, well, software and everything, and then technical design, which is the people actually do the fit. And in the early days, I'd have one people do both those. And then right. later, I'm like, because these people are six figure people. Right, right. And then I'm like, no, 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 uh, there's actually a difference here. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, with how things fit and the patterns are made. And, and when you can get to the point where you really can afford the appropriate level of expertise for each task that's when you really get things going um hmm. and uh anyway, that's that's what that's what worked for us <laughs> yeah well i'd say i mean that's just in general our our we have talked before on the show about eos and i'm not sure if you're familiar with that as an entrepreneurial operating system but they're they're uh, big on creating hierarchy and structure and and then getting to a point where you have specialists, not just generalists that are right. uh, running things. Um, and the reality is, like you pointed out early on, you have to be the doing it all. Yeah. But as you grow and develop, then you have to be able to and willing, not just able, but also willing right. to release some of the reins to allow other people where that is their specialization to step in, because that's what 
pours the metaphorical gas on the on the right. fire. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. Yeah. So, um, so you said 18 years to get to 100 million. Which, if you if you would do the math, and I was just kind of counting it out, so it would take if you started at a million dollars. I, I I can give some of the math for sales. Yeah. I mean, it's just these things are laser beam and laser beam in your brain. Oh yeah. Of course, year year one, and maybe you'd call that year zero. But you know, the first year we had we had no revenue. You know, right. It took us about fourteen months to get to a point where we could bring product to market. Okay. So yeah. Year, year one was zero, and I'm I'm doing millions of dollars of net sales. Then then three million. Then three million. <laughs> five million seven nine million i think like 12 then 19 and i think we got to like 30 and it um yeah. and it was those kind of things and you know in retrospect it might sound funny like oh well going from like five million to seven million but um you know it's a 40 percent increase yeah I remember really laying out the details of that. And, you know, we had to hire five more, like, really full time grown ups <laughs> and, you know, recruit them and bring them on. And of course, you see the expenses before you see the revenues. Right. And, you know, making that math work. Yeah. Uh, because they're, they're, there's a reasonably long development cycle in the apparel business from, you know, concept, design, sampling, and everything, and uh, about a 14 month cycle. Um, so you're seeing the expenses before you see uh, <laughs> the revenue and yeah, uh, it, it's an interesting puzzle to make. Yeah. A lot of <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, you, you touched on, you just said it was about 14 months, essentially where you didn't have any substantial or any revenue really coming through while you're developing. So how did you guys, how did you survive? So uh, the, the way we financed the business and we, um, you know, so I knew some things about the business. And I have some, uh, you know, I know the business and I have some skills in financial planning. Um, so we capitalized the business with $750,000 of paid in capital. Okay. And, uh, and we got bank debt of a million two fifty. Okay. Now, these were the days when banks would actually lend to, sure. and, and, and that bank debt was secured by personal guarantees. Right. And, yeah, stuff you know is, um, and and we took no salary, um, and um, uh, we took no salary for I think eighteen months, and then I think sixty thousand dollars a year. But I remember so in those days, so we started in early ninety three, um, and Bill Clinton was inaugurated. I think on the the day that we started our business in January 93. And in those days, you know, healthcare, health insurance costs were a big deal. And he was saying things like, oh, it would just be terrible. You know, like a family would have health insurance premiums like 65. And I know because we were paying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, but um, yeah, you know, you had to, um tough it out so i think I, I, I think you know when i think back and, and I, I was 39 when starting the business so i uh and i had four four kids eight, wow four through nine and wow uh, so you know there are a couple windows and um you know i was i've been thinking a lot you know when you start a business you know when's the right time and See, he's 39. Are you too old? Did you miss the window? Will you have the energy? And I had read, um, I'd read a couple books. Uh, Sam Walton started Walmart when he was 43. Hmm. And uh, you know, Thomas Watson Sr. started IBM when he was 42. Wow. Yeah. And um, you know, he had worked with National Cash Register for 20 years beforehand. And I think what you need, you need the appropriate mix of domain experience. And future runway. Yeah. And look, I know that there are people who started business at 23. And yeah, but but they're like, you can count like six people who have done that. Yeah. In the last 25 years. Right. Um, and I'm not sure that's what you use as the base. I think it's, you know, like Mozart was writing symphonies when he was eight years old. 
Right, know, right. Just a pearl of people in the world. I am not one of those. <laughs> well, it's a it's an interesting thought though because I, I there's this I think there is a a perception out there which I would consider it a misconception that you have to be young to be an entrepreneur. Young and you know define young, but in the you, you were spot on a little bit with your life stage was also very different than what people think as a typical entrepreneur. It's like, well, I'm young and I have no, I might be single, no obligation. So I really can throw caution to the wind and go for it. I mean, you're, you got four kids that are under 10. You're taking a tremendous amount of risk doing that. Yeah. I remember thinking consciously for, uh, four kids in five years, they're age four through nine then. Is that right? And I remember yeah. thinking, well, they're out of diapers, but I'm not yet being crushed by tuition. So I, have, <laughs> so I still have that window. But yeah, I have a little window here. But I can speak to that point. And if you don't mind, I take a sip of water. Go for it. So, you know, entrepreneurs take risk, but they're not reckless. You know, you're not looking to destroy your life or destroy a business. I, hmm. I think that's important. You know, you're not just gambling um recklessly um you know businesses wouldn't make it if you made it but i'll tell you the insight that i had and this is uh, this is really what made me decide and this is i think a really important insight keep in mind i was 39 years old i've been working there's a difference between business risk and career risk hmm. there's a difference between business risk and career risk Mm -hmm. This is maybe the biggest message that I would give to your audience. People are thinking of starting a business. So the business risk to do a startup in fashion apparel, you know, the business risk for that is very high. You know, failure rates in business, what, 95% fail after three years and all that, you know. So the business risk was high, but the career risk to me was low hmm. because um, if I would do this and let's say after three years or four years or something that fails my ability to go out and get a job decent paying job it was still high it might even be higher than it was beforehand because i actually think there are a lot of people who secretly wish they had had the guts to take a shot yeah and didn't and, mm -hmm. and admire it because i wasn't going to lose my intelligence i wasn't going to lose my experience I guess there's a question, do you have a little loss of confidence? But I just didn't think so. So the way to the way to handle that issue is that you really need to set parameters on time and money that you're willing to risk. Mm -hmm. so let's say that you're willing to spend three or four years of time of not making money, you know, busted, not making money, and maybe... Three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand dollars risk or something like that. Um, but what you don't want, you don't want to be treading water for eight years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you do that and fail, then the decision becomes very much like going to law school or going to med school. Right. Something like that, where yeah, you know, out of the workforce, I'm going to spend this money, and I think it's going to work out. So um, once I got my head around that. Um, that was really kind of the final piece of like, yeah, I'm going to take this shot here. Um, yeah. Yeah, like I didn't want to lose my house and all that kind of stuff, but um, um, you know, I, I just thought it was a, a reasonable bet, and and that I could go back and you know earn a decent salary in a with a company. So. You think it'd be, you mentioned career risk? Do you think that was also easier because? Um, you had all, you were in this either same or similar industry versus a complete pivot away from something you didn't know, trying to learn something new and then either trying to go back. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I talked about domain experience. Let me really call it relevant domain experience that, you know, I had worked in the apparel business. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had interviewed designers. Hmm. Um, and, you know, interview, how do you determine someone who's correct? I knew factors. I knew people in the industry. I had, I had relevant experience. I knew what international letters of credit were. Hmm. I knew how to clear things through U.S. customs. Yeah. Um, and hmm. so a, a lot, and, and you just don't want to be learning those things on the job uh, because you don't have a lot of room for error in yeah. startups because you're either... 
you're either under leveraged financially or under leveraged in terms of team. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't be, uh, you know, fully cushioned in both of those. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And um, so with relevant domain experience, you avoid some missteps that with experience are avoidable. Yeah. And, and the way I really thought about the business is that um, in fashion apparel, you're going to take risk in your designs and fashion. But let's not take risk in things like, do we know how to clear things through customs? Do we know inventory systems? Yeah. There? And, um, uh, you know, the, the extent to which you can take risk out of your business by managing it well, um, and then only take it where you need to, yeah, I think is pretty important. So, you get, I, I talk to people, I wouldn't say frequently, but a um, handful of people who feel like they have a bug that they, you know, want to get into entrepreneurship. Uh, There's definitely some where I get the sense that I don't think you really understand what it takes yet Um, because they may be in an organization where they're doing some operation and whatnot, um, and they think they can go out and and do it on their own, which they might be able to do that on their own, but there's a big piece of that that's missing, and that's getting people in the door. And sales and marketing is a beast of an undertaking to do it well, and... um, do you find that to me maybe one of the biggest hurdles then that, that people need to figure out how to overcome? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, before you launch, and, and I mean, well, depend on your circumstances. Uh, maybe there, you know, I, I did not have wealth. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I describe myself as nouveau poor. Uh, <laughs> the, um, I mean, you you have to lay out a business plan. You you have to lay out um, a business plan and find a business model that works. And uh, you you just have to figure out, you know, like, how do I get to revenue? You know, um, what does that look like? Um, How do I develop a product or service that's ready for sale? And what's the selling process? And, um, you know, how long is that selling cycle? And I remember you know, years ago, this is um, uh, when I was working in the parallel industry, we had put together a board of directors and there was a company called Shared Medical Systems. Um, this is in the 80s, uh, in the early days of shared computer systems. And they focused on the healthcare industry. And the, the co-founder of that business was a, uh, a guy named Harvey Wilson. And he told me, he said, he said the sales cycle took two years then hmm. you know, from the time you had identified a prospect and had the initial meeting because it, right. and we're talking in the meetings here that yeah. the idea of you know like hospitals outsourcing a piece of their um systems you know software systems was pretty new i mean right yeah. now all companies you know outsource payroll like you wouldn't consider right. doing payroll in house but in the early 80s these were very new concepts yeah and he said even when he had his his business up and it was good. It was a two year site sales cycle Jeez. from like the first meet after identifying yeah. having the first meeting and then they need more people. Then you do a proposal and they ask the proposal and the installation. Also. And so you <laughs> just, you have to, you just have to lay out your business plan. Yeah. You have to see how you're going to get to revenue Yeah, and, and, and what that takes and, and, you know, so to, you know, to start up and even if, if we get to, you know, if you want to grow a business faster than the industry growth rate, and of course, and for most startups, you need to, right? Yeah, right. Right. So let's say the industry is growing 5% a year, but you need to grow 20% a year. And even if you're growing from a million to a million to... Right. It's 20%. Right. So the math on this is very simple. The only way mathematically you can do that is, number one, 
You have to be converting people who are currently using an existing product and service to come to you, mm -hmm. or your offering needs to be so compelling that you're actually expanding that segment of the market. Um, uh, like for example, if you think of Lululemon yeah. and the yoga pants, that it was so good that people who used to wear high-end denim now, you know, now wear Lululemon yoga pants. Right. So mathematically, that's the only way that it can work. And for either of those things to work, your product or service needs to be compelling and excellent. Mm -hmm. it can't just be good. Because if, if someone's already in the market and they're using a competitor, like for them to switch, it, they need a really good reason. Yeah. It's not just we think we're good enough. It's no, 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 no. You've got to figure out the segment of the market that you're doing, and you have to have an offering that's better than what's out there. Yeah. Like, buy a lot. Yeah. Um, so um, it, it needs to be compelling and excellent. Um, and even with that, the sales conversion cycle can be a little longer than you think. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you, you just need to do that analysis and, 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 and figure it out. And, and, you know, from a personality standpoint, you just have to be willing to uh, hear no a lot of times. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> yeah, right. Because it's gonna happen. You're gonna hear yeah. that a lot. A lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, and 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 you need some rough metrics like like what does a million dollars in revenue look like? Is that yeah. a thousand customers doing a thousand dollars of business with you in a year? Or I mean, just something that simple. Or right. is, or is it a hundred? accounts doing ten thousand dollars with you or you know what does it look like yeah um, and Boy. you have to you have to be able to get your arms around that uh, early. You, you shared with me uh that you know you you said in the future i have this vision of having one million people spending x amount of money on average per year which it happened to be almost to the to the dollar amount of what you ended up selling it for but the right. interesting thing about that is your so that that was your what what i would consider your BHAG probably your big hairy right. audacious goal yeah and when you think about that 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 seems so unattainable at at, at its surface level because you think oh my gosh how do i get to 200 million dollars in revenue but then when you break it down like you did it says well all right it's a million people spending this much money. Two hundred dollars, right? And that's not that's not a lot of money. And how do I get to that million people? Yeah. And and then and and you're right. That was the vision. It's like, well, could we get a million people spending two hundred dollars a year with a brand? And and um, and that's two hundred million dollars. And now it took us twenty three years to do that. Yeah. That's you know, pretty much what what happened. And when you think of it that way, it really helps to shape your work the parameters your work you know you don't, you don't need to be mass yeah you don't need people yeah you don't need to be mass. and um and you don't need to sell them two thousand dollars right two hundred dollars and 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 the micro marketing uh of it really helps and and look my partner's a really really smart guy but you know we would do things and, and look we both grew up in the Northeast, I, uh, you know, outside the Philadelphia area, but our business was, um, it, you know, the Southeast was a really important part. So, so we learned, um, you know, like SEC football games, like, yes. SEC, like football games at Clemson's, you know, people dress up for that, you know, yeah. I, mean, they, I mean, this is like a big deal. Yeah. And, I mean, and they got a party beforehand. I mean, there are women who are planning their wardrobes for the SEC football games you know at the beginning of the season well there's going to be the party beforehand the party, mm -hmm. the party afterwards and a different dress for each of those and like we're doing the math we're like geez if you get like sixty thousand people at each yeah. sec game and there are 12 of those 12 teams and they play 10 games they need right. to like could you do it just by servicing you know, right. the SEC? and that might sound you know ridiculous but if it's like well we need a million people to win 200 it's like geez SEC, and what if we got really, really good at it? You know, what do they need for that? Yeah. And um, 
but it, it, it helps to shape everything. Yeah. I know it because there probably aren't that many people focused on that. No. And when I talk about being excellent and compelling. You could be excellent and compelling like that. And, you know, it, it, I remember something we do, we develop a print that might be, you know, coral and turquoise and have alligators in it. And it turned out like the gator, we'd see these you know, sales in Gainesville in the fall going up ridiculously. And like the people who are like gators, fans, yeah. these to the party, <laughs> tailgate parties. I'm yeah. Like, Ugh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, but uh, so, you know, you, you don't need to be mass. Um, hmm. And, you know, so a story I'll tell on that. Um, and I know this seems like such ancient history, but uh, when I was in graduate school, this is back in like 1976 or so, that I heard a, a speaker on campus that was the founder of Perrier. Okay. We had like Thursday afternoons, we had these speakers on campus. Now in 1976, nobody was paying money for water. <laughs> water was free. <laughs> You yeah. got it from faucets. You got it from drinking fountains. Uh -huh. Nobody was buying bottled water in 1976. Nobody. Yep. And this guy is going to be on campus and he's going to tell about this concept that he has selling bottled water in little six ounce bottles at twice the price of a Coke. Yeah. You know? and, then he's got, and I'm like, I got to hear what this is about. You know, I mean, <laughs> get some laughs for this. Yeah. But what he said, and I, I remember it, uh, he, he, so at that time, the bottled and canned beverage market in the US was a $40 billion market. And he said that if he got 1% of that, he could have $400 million in sales. You get $400 million in sales, you got a real company. Uh, so he thought in terms of one in a hundred. He said, I just, I need, one in a hundred customers. I need one in a hundred occasions, but for those, I need to be perfect and be able to provide a premium experience. He says, what are these? Well, college graduation party, 30th birthday, wedding reception, you know, baby shower. You know, he starts listing these things and I need 100 people and he's selling these little six ounce bottles you know, this uh, carbonated water for double what a, what a Coke cost. You know, yeah. my, but it was a premium experience. And then you started seeing those. You, you, you'd go to somebody's 30th birthday party or something. Yeah. And it's sort of Perry and it's like, oh, this is a special thing. And then, and oh, by the way, it worked. <laughs> <It's just laughs> work. But he didn't need to dislodge Coke. He needed to outflank them for that one tiny slice. Right. Um, and, and that was, I'm like, wow. This is a different way to think. Um, and, you know, because people think like bigger is better. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, you can't dislodge companies that are bigger than you because the math doesn't work. And, yeah. and I'm like, wow. And, and essentially, you know, Lily Pulitzer is a version of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like a Perrier of. Perrier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they specialize, not for everybody. Um, but we didn't need everybody. Exactly. So uh, that's a that was a really really big concept uh, huh. for for us. So you have to like do that math, right? So, so did did some of that because I think some of those th those abilities and skills to uh, to be able to either do that math, put those plans in place, and whatnot. Some of that maybe is is just natural in some people, but some of it comes from either learning, uh, education, background, whatnot. So what I, I know. You have uh, one thing I was going to ask is you have an MBA, I believe, yeah, uh, from uh, a little school that people might have heard of. A well-known Eastern business school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Um, but did, the, did that help? Uh, did the the Harvard Harvard there help? Yeah. I, and, and, my, and my partner went there as well. So. Okay. Is, yeah, did you guys I, meet there? It, um, quite, uh, we did not. We, okay. uh, we actually... Um, uh, he's younger than I, and at the company I worked beforehand, I hired him to come to work there. Okay. Okay. Work together. 
before, but yeah, you, you know, yeah, you develop those skills and, uh, you know, at the business school, um, you know, at the case study, you really learn how to solve problems in the context of the situation. So like what yeah. we did for Holy Pulitzer, that's not what you do for Under Armour. Yeah. Um, you know, at, um, but at Lily Pulitzer, we were looking to do, you know, a niche concept appealing to a resort market, very happy, you know, female. And um, so the case study method really helps you to figure that out, you know. Okay. Yep. How does this work for this context of what you're trying to do? And, and um, like Under Armour, you know, as an example, they, they need to be masks. You know, for uh, or uh, I, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It, you know, yeah. it, um, you know, to do what they're doing to sell, um, you know, fifty dollars shorts. Right. Uh, exactly. For athletic wear, you need it for a lot of people. You know, yeah. and um, and I'm not saying that the niche marketing approach is right for them, but. Yeah, those things help. And you know, just mechanically, we learned, uh, you know, how to think about those things. And, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's problem solving. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and just thinking through the steps. I had, I had played um, chess. I'd played competitive chess early in my career. And a lot of times it, it seemed the same, you know, like, mm. Right. Yeah. What new, you know, we have these pieces. How do you move them? Uh, yeah. And, um, but boy, if it's just like, hey, let's show up and see what happens. Oof. I know, man. I know. So the the kind of a broken down. I have a, my um, Vistage chair uh, that I'm uh, part of was <clears throat> he calls something just going through a bunch, you know, some if then scenario planning so you, you have this general idea and then all right if this happens then what or if that happens then what um to try to help with what you say maybe your case study methods or uh, or scenario planning yeah but you know in relation to chess you're thinking not just all right i'm gonna put piece here to here but it's well if i do that then what is the my opponent likely going to do and then what do i want to likely do to counter that and you know right. you have to be not just thinking your next move but two three four five moves yeah ahead to yeah. and you know not because that's exactly what's going to happen but you need to be prepared to know what's likely or what may happen so that you can adjust and pivot as you as you go along yeah i think the other things i'd say with and start starting business and operating business is that you just you have to have a strategy you just you have to have a strategy um and it's probably something that you can articulate pretty easily you know that you know lululemon was doing you know yoga pants for women you know it's a strategy yes but you have to have a strategy that you can lay out reasonably well because that helps you shape the team you see, they, I, I think ultimately, I think organizations compete on the basis of strategy and team. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you know, so uh, like, for example, at, at Lily Pulitzer, you know, custom print design was a very important part of our strategy. You know, it was really viewed as our number one competitive advantage. So, so we had to hire print designers, you know, not just designers. Print designers. print designers, right? Um, and actually, print designers who like to do the kinds of things, really, uh, you know, not not black and gray geometrics. Yeah, um, and um, you know, things that were whimsical um, without being juvenile. And um, so, you have to have a strategy so that you know how to shape your team. Because recruitment, building that team is really key. You yeah. just can't do it with, as I say, you know, if, if you work 24 hours a day, you can only do the work of three people. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times I think entrepreneurs think, oh, well, I'll just stretch a little harder. And, and, and look, we worked 
really hard for a long time. But, you know, if you work 24 hours a day, you can only do the work of three people. And if the concept that you have is going to require more than three people, by definition, you must delegate and build team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you got to think about those skill sets. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you got to build the right ones because on those moves, it's, um, you know, these step, it's not just, you know, a, a, just a, a linear pivot there. It's a step function. Everything you yep. do is a series of little step function. You hire somebody and, yep. and um, that adds more skill here, but adds more cost. And it's, you know, it's not just perfectly smooth. And those hirings come before the sales come and, you know, making that, making that model work, um, you know, requires skill mm -hmm. and, and some luck. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. It's definitely a combination of both. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, I got to tell you, I could sit and talk to you for hours about this <laughs> because it's just, uh, it's fascinating. Um, you are a, uh, you bring a wealth of knowledge because a lot of your experience and a lot of your background, and it's been uh, just a true joy thus far. Um, but I do like, so when I wrap these interviews up, what I love to do, and yours is going to be a little different, so it might lead into, a, 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 your answer might be a little bit different because um, you are you are retired and, and out of that business now. But I like to ask, if Scott's looking ahead five years from now, what would need to happen in his life to consider it a success? Normally, that's in the context of somebody still in running and building their business, and so they're talking about it that way. But being now retired, your life looks a little different than it did before. So what, what would life have to look like for it to be a success? Well, uh, just to give context, I mean, I'm, I'm turning 70 in a, a month or so. And um, uh, I have four children, I have four grandchildren. Um, so, you know, maintaining just positive, loving relationship with them and having her be healthy and happy. Yeah. Uh, 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 I am single but i do have a relationship having that continue to grow and develop <laughs> part of it um health part of it one thing i will say is um as you get older i would say this really by the time you get to your like late 50s um you really need to spend more time on personal fitness just to mm. save, save off the decline you know and um you know i, I know in the long run we'll lose that battle but you have to you just have to dedicate more time to it. And mm -hmm. um, uh, you just don't want to be, get to a point where like getting in and out of your car is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I also, um, the other thing that happens when you get older, you get grandchildren and so forth. And I have grandchildren ranging age from seven through seven years through eight months. Um, but you really want to leave them a world that's better than the one that we inherited. And yeah. I gotta say, that's something that stresses me a little bit now. And, and, um, you know, I would really like for, uh, you know, my grandchildren to grow up in the same land of opportunity that I did. Yeah. And, and I worry about that a little bit. So, you know, you can't fix everything. <laughs> In fact, one of the things I, I remind myself of the serenity prayer, which is, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Yeah. Change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> That's everything. But I, I think for me, I've been, uh, I've been, in externally, I've been trying to focus, I think, school choice is a place where um you know in my lifetime with energy i have and resources and skill uh is a place where i can move the needle a little bit and, yeah um you know our public education system our k-12 public education system is failing you know the the um uh, i mean the percentage of students in the united states at grade level for reading in fourth grade is like less than 35 percent hmm. uh, in eighth grade it's worse so i am uh, so i'm a co-founder of a charter school hmm. 
in the uh, with a, a friend of mine. He, he did he did all the heavy lifting. <laughs> I, helped him I, I helped him, but he um, uh, in the city of Chester. And um, I, I think the other thing is that um, so we have six hundred fifty kids, <laughs> K through twelve. And a lot of times, I think you want to scale. You want to think, oh, I want to do something big. And you know, the ability to do that's pretty limited. But I think if you can make a difference locally, yeah. You know, like if we can help 650 kids in Chester, that that's worth doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I one of the things I use, you know, if um, I mean in Scripture, you know, Jesus didn't say, Jesus said, feed people. He didn't say eradicate hunger. Mm-hmm. I think that's an important differentiation. Hmm. And, um, uh, so I'm trying to, you know, pick some spots and things. Uh, you know, where can I do some things that make a difference? But, but look, I also want to make sure family, personal health. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be consumed with it. I spent I spent 40 years being consumed by that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Noble Pursuits, and you know, I'm, I'm have a little bit of a knowledge. We get to talk about the the school that you're running, and um, you know, in my opinion, from what you shared, it's really the the definition of serving those who uh, who really need it most and making a huge difference and an impact in those kids' lives. So, um, so that's amazing, and that's going to continue to be a blessing to to those kids and those families. Well, I think I went to public school. I went to Council Rock High School in the town of the, you know, uh, and um, got a good education. But I'll, I'll tell you, some of these inner city schools are failing. If, like the idea of being 11 years old and knowing that you're like towards a dead end is just. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. I never felt that way. Yeah. And I wouldn't want anybody else to. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I know you're going to keep doing great things because uh, your work's not over. So that's that's cool. And I look forward to seeing what more uh, there is to come. But, Scott, it has been just a, a pleasure and a joy to be chatting with you here and, and hearing about what you're doing. And um, I, it's, been, it's been it's been great. So I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I have. I have. Yeah. I, I appreciate your having me on. Yeah, it's been it's been awesome. So uh, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing everything. Everybody that's uh, that's tuning in here. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, look, we went a little longer than uh, than we normally do. And uh, candidly, that's because I can. And really, it was easy. Uh, I, I mean this when I say I could have probably done this for another two hours and not blinked in uh, batted an eye. But I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. A lot of great stuff in here. And, uh, you know, I hope you continue to tune in to our podcast as, again, we get to bring this message of entrepreneurship. And really, uh, Scott just hit on something. Uh, entrepreneurs are the ones that help to continue to um, create the, the land of opportunity that, uh, that we've been able to be a part of here in America and are continue, going to continue to do so. So I'm, I'm proud to be able to bring that message to all of you, and I hope you enjoy it. Scott, again, thank you so much. Thank Everybody you. at home, we will see you on the next episode of the Born Podcast. Thanks.